Hey everyone, I'm Jensen. It's Thursday, September 24th, and from an update on the Braylon Noble case, two more guidelines for Ohio nursing homes. I have all the stories you need to know to get in the loop tonight. First, let's take a look at the latest coronavirus data from the state. Today, there were 991 new cases reported compared to the 21 day average of 982. There are 28 new coronavirus related deaths compared to the 21 day average of 23. There were 74 new hospitalizations compared to the 21 day average of 66 and 10 new ICU admissions compared to that 21 day average of 11. And DeWine covered a lot of ground in his press conference today. So what I watched in an hour and a half, I'll sum up for you in around five minutes. So you are welcome. Now, the biggest story I think out of today's conference has to do with nursing homes. Nursing home facilities will begin allowing indoor visitation on October 12th, but not without a lot of regulation. So for some background, on June 8th, assisted living facilities could begin outdoor visitation and then nursing homes followed suit on July 20th. But with the winter months fast approaching, that won't be an option for too much longer. So Ohio Department of Aging Director Ursula McElroy hopped in on today's conference to break down what will be expected as we move towards these indoor visits. Facility leaders need to determine their level of readiness, so look at community spread, cases within the facility, staffing levels, access to testing, supply of PPE, and local hospital capacity. They will limit entry to personnel who are necessary to the operations of the facility. So this includes healthcare providers, governmental representatives, and regulators, but hospice personnel, clergy, and hairstylists fit into that category too. They'll have to screen staff and visitors as they enter and maintain a daily log of people who do come inside. Visits must be scheduled in advance and occur in designated visitation areas. Visits will be 30 minutes maximum and two visitors are permitted per resident per visit. And while while there is no age restriction for visitors, they have to be able to wear a mask and maintain six feet of social distance. Some other key points here, communal activities will be allowed with social distancing in place and in a safe environment. And facilities will have to develop a written and transparent plan so families are able to know what is going on and have a clear idea before they visit the facility. Plus, they shouldn't be restricting visitation without any good reason. Facilities will be reporting visitation information to the state and that will all be available on a dashboard on the state's coronavirus website whenever there is information to be had. Now let's look at colleges for just a second. DeWine issued recommendations today calling on all residential colleges and universities to regularly test a sample of the population of their asymptomatic students and noted that some schools are already doing this. School leaders on each campus should plan to screen at least 3% of their at-risk population but that's all we know right now more formal guidance is expected to be released in the coming days. And there were a few small changes to the state's sports order. Lieutenant Governor John Houston announced today that that one game per day rule is no more. So you can be able to play more than one game in one day. However, something that will be added in the upcoming new sports order is a provision that will require each sports venue to cooperate with local inspectors who are put in charge of ensuring compliance with state health orders. These inspectors have the authority to end gameplay if they find people violating guidelines. Uh, we're loosening up uh, the opportunity or, or adding opportunity, but we're also going to make sure that we follow the rules so that we can continue to maintain these uh, events in a healthy and uh, successful manner. And one last noteworthy point from today's conference, DeWine issued a proclamation activating roughly 300 members of the Ohio National Guard to help Cleveland police ensure a safe environment for those attending the first presidential debate in Cleveland on Tuesday. And that move comes after Governor DeWine received a formal request from Cleveland officials last night. And in case you missed it last night, to-go cocktails could soon become a permanent thing here in Ohio. Back in April, during the stay-at-home order, DeWine started letting businesses with liquor licenses sell and deliver drinks. What originally started as a way to help restaurants make some extra cash during the closures quickly became House Bill 669. By June, members of the Ohio House were on a mission to make takeout margaritas, mojitos, and other cocktails permanent. The bill passed in the House 84-8, to and yesterday, House Bill 669 passed 30-2 to in the Ohio Senate, and now it's headed to DeWine's desk for approval. So we'll keep you updated on that. 
and some people may have to start having those cocktails at home. Since May, Uber said it has removed more than 1,250 riders in the U.S. and Canada from the platform because of their failure to comply with the company's mask mandate. And after noticing a lot of non-compliance, at the beginning of this month, Uber unveiled a new rule saying that if a driver reports to Uber that a rider wasn't wearing a mask, that rider will have to take a selfie with one strapped on the next time they try to order a ride. The full requirement rolled out in the US and Canada today, but it will eventually go to other places around the world as well. But let's focus a little bit more locally here. A search warrant executed in the case of three-year-old Braylon Noble shows that the same day the toddler was reported missing, police searched the apartment and seized the items in case the boy's disappearance turned criminal. A search warrant obtained from the Toledo Municipal Court showed that police searched the apartment and a Jeep Liberty registered to Braylon's grandmother, Bobby Johnson, the day that Braylon was reported missing. As a result of the search warrant, police seized a cigarette butt found on a chair on the balcony, an Amazon tablet, a Samsung tablet, six cell phones, a claw hammer, and a box of Glad trash bags. Braylon's grandmother was listed as the possessor of the seized property. Braylon Noble was reported missing by his mother on September 4th, prompting a days-long search for the boy that ended with police finding Braylon's body in the pool of Hunters Ridge Apartments where Braylon's family lived. Initial details on the autopsy of Braylon by the Lucas County Coroner's Office found no obvious signs of trauma on his body and said drowning has not yet been ruled out as a cause of death. And I want to make clear that no manner of death has been officially determined and the coroner's office is now waiting to do a toxicology and a microscopic test. And as always, let's end on something more fun and lighthearted, right? After 25 years, the father of the bride, Banks family, is coming together for a special reunion. So tomorrow at 6 p.m., there will be a special Father of the Bride 3-ish reunion special, which will be shown on the Netflix Facebook page and on its YouTube channel. It will include original cast members like Steve Martin, Diane Keaton, Kimberly Williams Paisley, Martin Short, Kieran Culkin, George Newbern, and a few special guests. So we'll see who that is. It's also written and directed by Nancy Meyer who co-wrote the first two Father of the Bride movies. So make some popcorn and kick off your weekend in a cool, nostalgic way. But that is all I have for you today. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. I'm Jensen, and now you are in the loop.